Good evening and welcome again, those of you joining us from Shiloh Springfield Seventh-day Adventist Church to the second night of our week of prayer uh, as we look at how the gospel prepares us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I pray with all of my heart that the message yesterday was a, a blessing to your soul as we took a look at what is the gospel. We saw that the gospel is not a list of doctrines. Amen? We saw that the, gos the gospel is not a what, it's, it's a who. It's actually a person, and the person is Christ our righteousness. Jesus Christ, our faithful high priest, that is the gospel. And by the grace of God, we saw that the everlasting gospel spoken of in Matthew 24 and verse 14 that ushers in the end of the world is in fact the first, the second, the third, yea, even the fourth angel's message, which ripens the harvest, ripens the character of God's people. For the second coming of Jesus. Beloved, today we're going to be looking at a subject I've entitled, How the Gospel Prepares Us, Why Seventh-day Adventists. Have you ever asked yourself, beloved, why you are a Seventh-day Adventist? Of all the denominations in the world, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Does God have a, 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 a greater love for our people? Is that how we ended up with the message of the first, second, third, and fourth angel? No, beloved. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. What that simply means is God does not play the game of favoritism. He loves the atheist the same way he loves the believer. He loves the Baptist the same way he loves the Methodist. He loves the Roman Catholic the same way that he loves the Seventh-day Adventist. The question is, why are we Seventh-day Adventists today? We want to take a look at our identity in Christ, how we got to where we are, and what exactly God expects of this movement. You see, the Bible speaks in Revelation 14 of a people called the 140 and 4,000 who follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. We saw that the Apostle Paul and the other disciples preached Christ and Him crucified. Amen? So they followed Him to the cross by the grace of God and by faith. Amen? They followed Him there in the outer court. But when Jesus in 31 AD... I'm getting ahead of myself. When Jesus in 31 AD ascended to the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, the apostles by faith followed him there. Here we are in the year 2020, beloved, and for 175 years, this movement, believing that Christ moved from the holy into the most holy place, October 22nd, 1844, for 175 years, we have been preaching the imminent return of Jesus. Now, beloved, if you're, if, you're, if you're a candid thinker, if you're a, a, a close Bible student, the question should be coming to your mind now. What is taking so long? Why the delay? Jesus said, my coming is near even at the door, and he still hasn't been able to make his return. The question is why. Seventh-day Adventists, we need to understand the answer to this question, because I tell you from the offset of this message, we are not simply another denomination. God did not call us into existence to be a denomination. He called us to be a movement. This is the Seventh-day Adventist movement. We are to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes, even into the victory we find on the Day of Atonement in that most holy place. We're going to get into it, beloved, but before we go into that, let us pause for a moment for a word of prayer. We've learned that there are five essentials necessary for successful Bible study. Number one, we need the correct textbook. Amen? I pray that you have your Bibles with you, beloved. I pray that you have your sword, that we may use this thing to get to the bottom of the question. Why Seventh-day Adventists? Number two, number two, we have to have a qualified teacher. We know that the Holy Spirit is the only effectual teacher of divine truth, so we need to ask for His assistance even now. What do you say? Number three, we need the teacher's method of teaching, which is uh, found in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 through 11, which tells us we are to be weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast, amen, and that precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We studied this yesterday. And the fifth essential, rather the fourth, before I, before I jump a number, the fourth essential is that we must come to the Bible as students, the correct mindset, come to the Bible as students. We saw that if we come to the Word of God with any self-sufficiency, uh, with any irreverence, with any prejudice in our hearts, that Satan would be by our side to misinterpret the clear words of Jesus. 
But if we would come to the Word of God as students, humility of spirit. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows how much. Nothing yet as he ought to know. But if we surrender the spirit of I know and are willing to be taught, then the Holy Spirit and the angels about us can do their job of assisting us in understanding and guiding us into all truth. The fifth essential, beloved, let us bow our heads. Our Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for the wonderful gift of your word. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity to come together into communion uh, with you this week, to look into your word and to see Jesus. And Father, today, as we would seek to understand why you have called this movement to exist, I pray, dear Lord, that you will open the ears of each Adventist that is listening. Open the ears of those who are not of our faith, who are listening. And Father, help us to see Jesus and your plan for this generation. Bless me, Lord. Hide me in the cleft of the rock that you alone may be seen is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, what is in a name? What is the significance of our name, Seventh-day Adventists? You see, when you look into the Word of God, you will learn a very simple principle. Anything God names has a mission attached to the name. Anytime God gives a name, there is a mission, there is a calling attached to that name. For example, on our screen we see that in the book of Genesis, there was a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob's name meant supplanter. But God, when he met Jacob, changed his name to what? Israel, which meant to be an overcomer. Remember the night that Jacob wrestled with the angel and overcame the angel? Or rather, he overcame with the angel. Amen. Jesus said to Jacob, your name is no longer Jacob. It is no longer supplanter. That is not your character anymore. No, no, no. You are now Israel, which means overcomer. And by the grace of God, every one of us that overcomes both the hereditary and the cultivated sins to evil by the grace of God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, our name is Israel. We are overcomers through him that loved us. More than that, amen? Now, the Bible says that there was a woman named Sarai. Sarai, her name was changed to Sarah because she would become the mother of many nations. Can you see that when God gives a name, there is a mission, there is a character attached to the name? Follow on. Jesus, beloved, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, the angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. The angel did not say he would save his people in their sins, but from their sins. You see, many people claim to have Christ but fail to recognize the mission of the Savior. And so while clinging to the Savior by name alone, they miss entirely the experience that the Savior came to give to them. There are those of us who think we can be Christians in Christ and remain in sin. Beloved, that is not what Jesus came to do. His name is Jesus because he would save us not in our sin, but how? From our sins. That is what it means to have Jesus with you, to have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ came for a mission, but you see, the name was given by the Father through the angel Gabriel, and with the name came a mission that he had to accomplish. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, that his name is also Emmanuel, which being interpreted means what? God with us. The mission of Emmanuel was to be God with us. And as we study out this week, you're going to see just how much Jesus is God with us. God with you and God with me. We're going to see that. But can you see that the name comes with a mission? The Bible calls him the Lamb of God, John chapter 1 and verse 29, which takes away the sin of the world. Name means mission. That's the principle I want you to have. Write that down, beloved. Name means mission. What is your name, beloved? What is my name? Now, if I answer to you and I say my name is simply Brother Paul Punch, then I haven't yet understood the message. The Bible speaks of a man by the name of John the Baptist. 
And when John the Baptist was asked, what is your name? What do you say of yourself? John the Baptist did not respond, my name is John the Baptist. No, no, no. He responded with his mission. He said, I am the voice of one who cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. What is your name, beloved? Do you know your mission? What is your name, Seventh-day Adventist. Your name has a mission attached to it. And I want you to have that for yourself today. I want you to have your identity for yourself today. Let me tell you something, a Seventh-day Adventist who understands the burden of that name cannot eat the way the world eats. A Seventh-day Adventist who understands the burden of that name cannot live the way that the world lives. Cannot dress the way that the world's dressed. No, beloved, we are bought with a price. Do you understand that you are expensive? Now, I'm, I'm speaking to Seventh-day Adventists, yes, but the principle is general to, 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 to humanity, period. You are bought with a price. Beloved, you are expensive. Beloved, the moment that people begin to realize, the moment that Seventh-day Adventists begin to realize the cost of sin, we will put that thing down because it costs too much. If you walked into a store and you picked up a pair of shoes that cost $2 million, I pray to God you would put it down. Don't touch that credit card, beloved. I'm not playing with you. I pray that you would put that thing down. Why? Because it costs too much in the same way. When we look upon the cross and we see that our savior is there dying, beloved, an eternal death, because of my transgressions, how can I go and pick up the thing that I know I cannot afford? It costs too much. You are bought with a price. Seventh-day Adventist, what does the name mean? What is the mission behind the name? That's what we're looking at right now. That is what we're looking at. I want you to understand that there was someone else in the Bible who was given a very special name by God. And with every name comes a... Mission, praise the Lord. With every name comes a mission. Do you remember the angel by the name of Lucifer? Pay close attention. In the Bible Echo, November 1st, 1892, in paragraph three, we are told, Satan had been who? Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory in heaven. What did Lucifer mean? It meant light bearer. It meant sharer of God's glory, God's character in heaven. Beloved, God gave Lucifer that name, and with that name, God determined the mission that best suited Lucifer. God determined the best way for Lucifer to use his talents. He was to uplift and glorify the glory of God, the character of God. Now question, is that what Lucifer does today? In fact, if you're calling him Lucifer today, you don't understand that he, he, he long since has left that mission. His name is Satan because he is an accuser of the brethren. His name is Satan because he is the adversary of our souls and the adversary of Christ. Satan is his name because the mission that God initially gave him, he chose to relinquish. What is the lesson there, beloved? The lesson is very simple. You may have the right name. You may be in the right church. You may be with the right pastor and in the right congregation and at the right time. But if you don't choose to follow on with the mission that is attributed to that name, beloved, then the mission can never be accomplished. You see, simply having the right name, simply being in the right church does not guarantee the mission's success. Only choice can do that. Only choice can do that. Today, when we look upon the church, there, there's a lot of apostasy going on. We can't deny it. There's a lot of confusion going on in the midst of God's church, so much so that there are faithful Seventh-day Adventists who wonder if the church has become Babylon. I tell you emphatically upon the word of God, beloved, that God's church will never be Babylon. In fact, the Greek word for church is ecclesia. And when you study that word, it actually means an assembly of called out ones. God's church are those who respond to the call out of Babylon. Those who are separated by the mighty cleaver of truth. The first, the second, the third, yea, even the fourth angel's message. God's church will never be Babylon. But beloved, when we don't understand our mission, 
When we don't understand the importance of the significance of the doctrines given to us, do you understand that Babylonians do come in? While the church is not Babylon, there are Babylonians in the experience in her midst. And let me tell you something, beloved. We're coming to a time where everything that can be shaken will be shaken out. Know your identity. Know who you are. Know what you believe in, beloved, and stand. The Bible says, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. You need to know these things. Now, I want you to, I want you to really, really, really think about what I'm saying right now. Because I'm not trying to irreverently challenge you. I've told you already, you're my family, praise the Lord. This is Brother Paul speaking. I'm your brother in Christ. And as I'm challenging you, I'm challenging myself. Because, beloved, God's people are expected to have an experience that is higher than Enoch. Closer than Moses. Beloved, we need an experience such as never was in order to go through a time of trouble such as never was. It's going to require an experience, an inter, a, a, a communion, a close personal relationship with Jesus such as never before. If we don't have it now, beloved, I tell you, I am thankful that we live this side of probation because time is not yet up. We can get it now. The Bible says, come and buy of me gold tried in the fire. Beloved, the Bible says, come and receive white raiment that thou may be clothed. Everything we need, everything we lack, Christ is full of that thing. But we need to learn to treat Christ, beloved, not as a resource. He is the source itself. It's not resources we need. It's not more doctrines we need. It's the man himself. Going back to the message, we're told right here, Satan had been Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory in heaven, and second to Jesus in power and majesty. In the words of inspiration, he is described as the one who sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But Lucifer had perverted the beauty and power with which he was endowed by the Creator, and his light had become darkness. When through this rebellion he was cast out of heaven, he determined to make man his victim and the earth his kingdom. He cast the blame of his rebellion upon who? Christ. And in determined hatred of God, sought to wound him through the fall of man. Beloved, the calling never guarantees the mission's success. Only choice can do that. You have to choose. You have to choose. Now, what's in a name? Here on the screen, we have the name that God has given this denomination, the name that God has given this movement. And the name is what? Seventh Day Adventist. Now, as you look at this name, uh, I've often heard it referred to as, you know, when you're looking at the Seventh Day Adventist name, Seventh Day uh, points us back to the creation week. It points us back to the Sabbath. And the word Adventist means the coming of. So the name in itself, simply put, means that we believe in keeping the seventh day Sabbath and all of the commandments. Amen. And that we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Beloved, is that all that there is to the name? We believe in the Sabbath, we keep the Sabbath and all the commandments and all the reforms, and then we're waiting for the coming of Christ? Is that what the name means and is that the end of the thing? No. Now that certainly is a part of the name, a part of who we are. No one can deny that. But is there more to be seen? Let's go back to creation week. On day one, God created earth, space, time, and light. On day two, God created the atmosphere. Day three, God makes land and plant life. You can see this in Genesis chapters one and two. On day four, God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. Hold on to that. God made the sun, moon, and stars on what day? Day four. Hold on to that. Day five, God makes the birds, the fish, etc. And on day six, God made man. God made man on day six. We know also that on day six, God made woman, correct? And then on day six, God also made the institution of marriage between a male and a female. Amen? That is when God made that. But was that the end of the creation story or was there something else to come? On day seven, beloved, God made the seventh day Sabbath by resting and sanctifying it. The Bible says in Genesis chapter two, verses one through three, thus the heavens and the earth were what? 
finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended. What did God do? God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his works, which God created and made. Now, the Bible says here that on the seventh day, God ended his work. So the word seventh day Adventist, the seventh day part, implies an ended, a finished, a completed work. Do you see that? Following on in the book of Exodus, chapter 31 and verse 13, the Bible says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, that is those that overcome, praise the Lord, saying, Verily my Sabbath shall ye keep, for it is a sign. Beloved, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does what? sanctifies you. Who does he sanctify? You, beloved. The word sanctify means to be made holy, to be set apart, to be called out for holy use. Beloved, the word seventh day means that when the finished work of sanctification when God finishes his work of sanctifying his church, when God has an equally yoked bride, holy even as our Father in heaven is holy, perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect, when that is finished, Christ will return. That is what the name Seventh-day Adventist means. Can you see it? So it's not merely about believing in the Sabbath and waiting for the coming of Christ. It is seeing what the Sabbath represents, an experience of sanctification finished in Christ that ushers in, that hastens the coming of Jesus. Beloved, your name implies responsibility for the coming of Christ. Your name implies responsibility for the coming of Christ. If Christ won't return until his church is perfected in him, then our spiritual condition can either hasten or delay his coming. Do you see it? Now, some of you may have never heard that before, so I want to show you from the Bible that this is so. In the book of Joel chapter 2, let's go there in our Bibles. We're turning in our Bibles to the book of Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify. Do what? Sanctify. Hold on. The word sanctify is what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath signifies a sanctified people. Do you remember we read that a moment ago? It says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregate beloved are you seeing this the bible says sanctify who the congregation listen beloved the bible says sanctify shiloh springfield seventh day adventist church that is what we're reading here all right what is the result the bible says sanctify the congregation assemble the elders gather the children and those that suck the breast let the bridegroom go forth let the bridegroom go forth. Beloved, who is the bride in Bible prophecy? The bride of Christ? That is the church. If the bride of Christ is the church, who is the bridegroom? Who is the husband? It is Christ himself. Here the Bible says, sanctify the church and let Christ go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Some of us are waiting for the coming of Christ and wondering why it's dragging on so long. Beloved, the Bible says the reason Christ has not come, the reason the bridegroom has not come back is because you and I won't let him go forth. Our spiritual condition is not one that he can return and he can't come back for that, beloved. As long as we abide in sin, do you understand that Jesus is not coming back to save anybody? He is coming back for a people that he has saved and who have received and experienced and manifested by the grace of God the merits of our Savior. God is coming back for a people he has saved from sin. And until that is accomplished in you and I, 
Christ is, he doesn't have permission to come back. The Bible says, let the bridegroom go forth. The word let implies permission. All right. Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to come and drag you down the altar if you refuse to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. He is waiting for the bride to get dressed. And when we get dressed, beloved, now I'm not going to ask you how long it takes a woman to get dressed. No, no, no. I'm going to leave that with you because I want to stay out of trouble. All I'm going to ask you is why is it that for 175 years, this church, this woman, this bride, refuses to grow up in Christ, refuses to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, how long does it take to get dressed? That's the question on the heart of our high priest. That's the question on the heart of our husband. Jesus is waiting, lovingly waiting, beloved, for us to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. And when we are sanctified, he would be allowed to go forth of his chamber and receive us unto himself. The name Seventh-day Adventist, that's where we are. The name Seventh-day Adventist implies responsibility, accountability, beloved, for the coming of Christ. It means that you will allow yourself to be the people who are sanctified and who have kept the Sabbath as a sign of that sanctification, that completed work, so that Jesus can come. That's what your name means. Further evidence. In the book of Psalms, chapter 101 and verse 2. Psalms, chapter 101 and verse 2. Let's go there. I want to give you further evidence to uh, the fact that our name means that a completed and sanctified people will usher in the second coming of Christ. A people that are sanctified, a people that are made holy, signified by the seventh day, are going to usher in the coming of Christ. Psalms, chapter 101 and verse 2. The Bible says, I will behave myself wisely and how in a perfect way david asks a question oh when will you come unto me when will you come i will walk within my house with a perfect heart david is tying something together here he is asking the question when will you come lord when will you come unto me and he says that there is a direct correlation between the ability of christ to come to us all right, that's called an advent and the condition of our heart. If we walk in our home with a perfect heart, David says, the effect is that Christ can come. Do you see this, beloved? So this is not a principle that originates with Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventism simply came into existence at the right time to bring to fruition the principle that has always been there. Can you see that? Now, let's continue. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, paragraph 1 through 2, it is confirmed where it says, When the fruit is brought forth, immediately, what is that word? Immediately, he putteth in the sickle, because harvest is come. Now, we spoke about that harvest yesterday. It is the fruit of the third angel's message that brings that, uh, that makes that happen. Uh, she says, Christ is waiting. Who is waiting, beloved? Christ is waiting on you and I. She says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come. Beloved, read that sentence again. Because that sentence is your name. That sentence is your mission, Seventh-day Adventist. It says, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. That's a sanctified people, beloved. It says, then the Advent. Then he will come. Seventh day in experience brings the Advent. Do you see that? Beloved, I'm excited about this because as I'm reading this thing, I remember when I started learning these truths, it brought to my mind uh, a great deal of responsibility. When I think about Seventh-day Adventists, beloved, I don't think about just another church. I don't think about just another denomination. I think about people who have a responsibility at this time. We can't afford to respond to everything that we see in the world in the same way that every other denomination does because we have been called at such a time as this to usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, I, I pray, I pray, Father, be with us at this time. 
As we're learning these principles, I pray that you will guard our hearts from pride. Lord, we know that you are no respecter of persons, and so this truth comes to us now, not because of what we are, but because you are so good to your people. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, God has a plan for this movement. And the only way that we are going to uh, achieve our mission is if we understand what that mission is first. That's what we're doing today. And then we must choose to allow Christ to accomplish that. Let's finish this quotation. It says, it is the privilege of every Christian. Does that include the Methodists? Yes, it does. Every Christian, not only to look for, but to do what? Hasten. That means to quicken, beloved, to make it come faster. Hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to bring us back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. In order to understand what's going on here at the end of time, you're going to have to understand something of origin. You're going to have to understand something of origin. You're going to have to understand something of the purpose of God in creating man in the first place. When we go back to Genesis chapter 1, in verse 3, the Bible says, well, let's start in verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. What did God say? Let there be light. God has 66 books here. 66 books. And out of everything that is given to us, the very first thing he says to you and I is let there be light. What did God mean, beloved, when God said let there be light? He was, he was announcing his will for mankind. He was announcing his will for humanity. When God said let there be light, he was letting us know that it was never his plan for us to walk in darkness, never his plan for us to walk in confusion. He wanted us to walk in the light. Now the question is, what is this light he spoke of? Remember, we saw a moment ago that it was on day four that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. So when God initially said, let there be light, was he talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars? No, beloved, because God said, let there be light on day one and didn't create the celestial bodies until day four. There are four things, beloved, in the Bible, four things that the Bible refers to as light. The first one is God's law. The second is his word, the third is his son, and the fourth is his church. In the book of Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23, the Bible says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of light. So God's law is what? Light. We know that the word, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and of his church, he says, ye are the light of the world. So this repetitive theme of light we're beginning to see. When God said, let there be light, what did he mean? The Bible says in the book of John chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, speaking of Christ, in him was what? Life. Write that word down. In Christ was life, and the life was the light. Wait a second, beloved. What did God say in the beginning? He said, let there be light. Was he talking about the sun? No, beloved. Was he talking about the moon or stars? No. But what was he talking about? The Bible says in Christ was life and Christ's life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Beloved, Christ is the light of the world. It's, he didn't become the light of the world when he came and became man. No, no, no. Christ has always been the light of the world. And so when God initially said, let there be light, he was declaring his will for humanity that there should be a knowledge of God, a knowledge of Christ here in this world. His desire was for humanity to answer the question, not merely in sermons and preaching, but by the lives that we lived. The life of Christ is the light of the world. And when God said, let there be light, he was declaring that this world should not be a place of darkness, but should be a place where the life of God is experienced and witnessed in the lives of his people. Beloved, what a wonderful calling. Do you see that? 
That is the intention of God for you and I. Now we see that the name Seventh-day Adventist implies that that work is completed so that Christ can return. It implies that the original purpose of man is completed, we are sanctified, the life of God is perfectly reproduced, thus there is light and Christ can return to receive a people unto himself. Now if you call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist, I want you to know that you are assuming responsibility to allow the Savior to complete that work in you. Overcoming is what God expects of us. And overcoming is simply the experience of coming to Jesus over and over and over again. That is overcoming. Do you see what I'm saying? Overcoming is the experience of coming to Jesus over and over. Beloved, it is communion with God that is habitual. It is a habitual communion with Christ. When we learn to cease not from praying, when we learn to cease not trusting him with the situations that find us in this life, we will be overcomers. The Bible says, yea, we are more than overcomers through him that loved us. And so we understand now what God meant when he said, let there be light. Let's move forward. In the Desire of Ages, page 22 in paragraph one, we find confirmation. It says the earth was dark. But that wasn't God's will. God said, let there be light. She says, the earth was dark. How? Through misapprehension of God. That the gloomy shadows might be lightened. That the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force of authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love Him. His character. His what, beloved? His character. I will say His righteousness. It's one and the same thing. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Beloved, what is the grand central theme of the Bible? We saw that God said, let there be light because he wanted his character known by those who look upon this earth. He wanted us to express who he is. That was the purpose for creating man. But the earth was dark instead through misapprehension of God. We failed to complete our mission, beloved. And so we find ourselves in sin. What is the grand central theme of the Bible? What is the purpose of this book? We're told in education, page 125, paragraph 2 through 126 in paragraph 1, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan. What is the central theme of the Bible, beloved? The redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. We're told that from the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced where? In Genesis 3.15 in the, in the Garden of Eden. To the last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. The burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. What is the wondrous theme, beloved? The plan of redemption, man's uplifting, the power of God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. She says, he who grasps this thought, what thought? The thought that the central theme of the Bible is the plan of redemption. The thought that the burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is an unfolding of the plan of redemption. He who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He has the key. What does he have, beloved? The key. Question. If that man has the key, then anyone else who does not have that thought, what do they have? Locked doors. Locked doors, beloved. The reason why Babylon is so confused is because all of the doors are locked. They don't have the key 
to get out. They don't have the key. We're calling them out, beloved, but in order for them to get out, the door has to be open. Jesus says, I set before you an open door. Who can shut it? If Jesus shuts a door, beloved, no one can open it. If Jesus opens a door, no man can shut it. But here we're seeing that God has given us the key to open the door in understanding that the central theme of the Bible is the plan of redemption, that every book and every passage is burdened by the unfolding of the plan of redemption. What does this mean? On the screen we see that the Bible has how many books? 66 books. And from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the theme is what, beloved? The redemption plan. The redemption plan. Now question, in very few and simple words, what is the plan of redemption? What is it? The plan of redemption is the way, it is the what? The way God accomplishes redemption for man. The plan of redemption is simply the way that God restores his image in man. I'm going to say it again because repetition deepens the impression. The plan of redemption is the way. It is the way. It is the way that God accomplishes that for man. I hope that you caught that because we're about to go into it now. The way of salvation in the Christian temperance and Bible hygiene, page 15 and paragraph three, we are told, we can understand the value of the human soul only as we realize the greatness of the sacrifice made for its redemption. The Word of God declares that we are not our own, that we are bought with a price. It is at immense cost that we have been placed upon vantage ground. We have been placed where, beloved? On vantage ground. Dare I say we have been placed on higher ground? Praise the Lord. We have been placed upon vantage ground where we can find liberty from the bondage of sin wrought by the fall in Eden. She says, Adam's sin plunged the race into hopeless misery. But by the sacrifice of the Son of God, a second probation was granted to man. In the plan of redemption. Where? In the plan of redemption, a way, beloved, catch this, a way of escape is provided for all who will avail themselves of it. God knew that it was impossible for man to overcome in his own strength, and he has provided help for him. God knew that it was impossible for us to gain the victory on our own and in our own strength, so he has provided help. She says, in the plan of redemption, a way, beloved, has been made that we may escape. The Bible says in Psalm 77 and verse 13, thy way, thy what? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Beloved, when we look at the sanctuary model, when we look at that model, we see the unfolding of the way of redemption. The unfolding of the plan of redemption is where? In the sanctuary, because thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Question, does the Bible say that the way is the sanctuary? No, beloved. I want you to catch the distinction because a lot of times as Adventists, we, we, we get hung up on the doctrine itself, but we lose the sap. We lose the blood. We lose the life of the thing. The sanctuary is wonderful and all need to understand it in order to understand the plan of redemption. But the Bible does not say, thy way, O God, is the sanctuary. It says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, meaning, in the sanctuary, beloved, in the plan of redemption, there is something, there is someone, there is some way located there that if we grasp it, beloved, God is able to save the soul. Now the Bible says in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way. What did Jesus say? He said, I am am the way. So when we're talking about thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, what it's really saying is Christ is where? In the sanctuary. Beloved, Christ is what makes the plan work. In fact, I would have you know that the plan is that we should receive the man. 
The plan of salvation is that we should receive the man Christ Jesus. The restoration of the human soul in the image of God is entirely accomplished, completed, perfected in the man Christ Jesus. This is why the Bible says you are complete. Nothing missing. Where? In him. In Christ, beloved, it's already done. We need to abide there. Th this entire great controversy comes to an end when the Seventh-day Adventist, remember your name, when the Seventh-day Adventist allows that mission to be accomplished. We abide in Christ. The work is finished. It is completed. We are perfected in Him. His righteousness is witnessed by the entire world. And the Advent can come because He has a people that will let Him return. Beloved, are we catching this thing? Now, listen, I'm, I'm dropping sweat over here because this message is so good. I need, but Lord, 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 Lord. Lord, you know I love this message and I'm feeling the warmth of your love even now. Help me to uh, begin to wrap up these thoughts in such a way that we may all understand the significance of our calling at this time, our name, our mission. Lord, Jesus is so wonderful. And we're so grateful, dear God, that we have a privilege to have any part in this wonderful plan. Help us to see the man, dear God. And help us to receive the man day by day is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Beloved, the plan of redemption is in the sanctuary and the man Christ Jesus is the redemption plan. He is the way. He is the plan. Do you understand that? Let's move forward. Let's move forward. Here on the screen, I have a model of the earthly sanctuary. And we know that the earthly sanctuary had three parts. What were they? Outer court, holy place, most holy place. This is phase one. That was phase two, and the most holy place is phase three. Three parts, three different names, three different phases. Inspiration refers to it as a complete system of truth. Now, the fact that inspiration calls the sanctuary a complete system of truth, if you only understand the cross, if you only understand what happened in the outer court, and you never go into the holy or the most holy place, how much of the truth do you have? Is it complete? No, beloved, it is an incomplete system of truth. The majority of the Christian world stop the gospel at the cross with the words, it is finished. Now we're going to touch on what those words mean, but the majority of the Christian world stop right there. Their growth stops right there. They can go no further. The doors are locked, but you have the key, beloved, that unlocks the storehouse of God's word. And what is that key? The fact that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all about the redemption plan. And the redemption plan has not one phase, but two and three. Outer court. Holy place, most holy place. Start, middle, finish. The work began in the outer court, beloved, but it finishes where? In the most holy place. Moving forward, Christ descends to start his work. We know that the great controversy began in heaven between Christ and Satan, and Christ descended from heaven. We know that Christ lived by the word on earth, we know that the seven branch candlestick representing the light, Christ let his light shine in his earthly ministry. We know that he lived a life of prayer represented by the altar of incense. Christ was baptized, amen. And then finally, the lamb was slain, John chapter one and verse 29. Jesus was slain upon the cross, but upon the cross, as I said again, Jesus said the, these uh, very famous words, these three words that have closed the door to every denomination that, that has no idea about the completion of the plan. And the words are, it is finished. Now, beloved, in our last message, I told you that there's a difference between reading and studying. If you're simply reading these words, it's obvious why the world be believes that at the cross, the plan was finished because Jesus said it is finished. But when you study the Bible and see what was finished, what is he exactly talking about? Then something entirely new begins to surface. In the book of Romans chapter 5 verses 6 and verses uh, chapter 8 and verses 3 through 4, the Bible says that when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for people that were what? Without strength. There was no power in us, beloved, to live a victorious life. Christ died upon the cross while we were without strength. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, now is come strength. 
you'll read in Desire of Ages that those words were applicable to what took place on the cross when Jesus said, it is finished. When Jesus said, it is finished, he wasn't speaking about the plan. He was speaking, beloved, about the ratification of the power necessary to live a victorious life. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant your weakness has come to an end. Your weakness has come to an end because I have acknowledged it. I have partaken of it and I have conquered sin in that flesh, beloved. That is what he meant. When he said it is finished, he meant that we could now be made perfect in his strength by receiving the righteousness of Christ. Now, some of you may be asking, Brother Paul, what about Moses? Isn't Moses in heaven? Yes. That's way before the cross, though, is it not? What about Elijah? Wasn't he translated? Yes, he was. But that was way before the cross, Brother Paul. What about Enoch? Enoch walked with God and was taken to heaven. Was he not, Brother Paul? Yes, he was. But that was way before the cross. So how can you say that power came at the cross? Beloved, again, I use the word ratified. The cross was the ratification of the power. Listen, it has always been by the faith of Jesus. Moses walked by the faith of Jesus. Enoch walked by the faith of Jesus. Elijah lived and was translated by the faith of Jesus. It has always been by faith that we, that we live this life. But beloved, at the cross, God made good on his word. The reason why Elijah and Enoch and Moses were able to live that life long before Christ died on the cross was because when God gives his word, it's just that sure. It's just that good. This is the God that says, let there be light. And though there was no light before, what happens? There is light. When God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between the serpent and her seed. Listen, beloved, you can have that experience at the very time he gives the word. Long before the ratification, this is why the Bible says that Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Did he die at the foundation of the world or did he die on the cross? He died on the cross. But his word, beloved, from the beginning of the world, the council of peace from the beginning was just that sure. And so any man who believed in Christ, whether it was before the cross, during the cross, or after the cross, salvation has always been by the faith of Jesus. And we're seeing here that when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant that though we were without strength, now is come strength. Phase one, complete. We're told in Christ in his sanctuary, page 72, paragraph three, but when the Savior yielded up his life, and with his expiring breath cried out, it is finished. Then the fulfillment of the plan of redemption was what? Assured. The promise of salvation made to the sinful pair in Eden was ratified. Do you see that, beloved? I love that we have inspiration because then you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to depend upon my words. I don't have to depend upon my words. Inspiration says it right there. Praise God. So the word assure now, it means to make something certain to happen. Victory was now assured. When Jesus made the fulfillment of the plan of redemption assured, it meant that the completion of it was certain to happen, not that it was over. Do you see that? There are still two thirds of the plan to be completed after the cross. Now, understand what I'm saying. Salvation is full and complete today in Christ Jesus, all right? It is all there in Christ Jesus, but Christ now has to work out in you exactly what he and the Father worked out in his experience. He has to have a people, beloved, who live the exact same life. This is the purpose of the holy and the most holy ministration. Jesus is now focused upon doing the same thing in you that the Father accomplished in him during that earthly ministry. Beloved, th this thing that we're talking about is so deep, we're only scratching the surface. Okay, we're only scratching the surface and our time is nearly up right now. We're only scratching the surface. So I'm gonna need you to go and study for yourself. I'm gonna need you to go back and read, dust those books off, read The Desire of Ages, read Great Controversy, read Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Beloved, grasp these things for yourself. Steps to Christ, most precious book. Grasp these things. Because beloved, the more that we, that we delve into this, the more uh, uh, Christ is able to make of us exactly what we've been hoping for this entire time, exactly what the word says we ought to be. If we're not that yet, we have more studying to do. We have more looking upon Christ to do. And the more we look by beholding, we become changed. So we see that when Jesus said it is finished, he was saying that the plan was assured. It was certain to happen. He had ratified the covenant upon the cross. 
But we know that it, the story did not end there. Christ ascended to finish his work, did he not? We know that the labor represents baptism, which represents newness of life. Christ was resurrected after his death, amen? And we know that in the book of Revelation, John saw Jesus in the holy place amongst the seven branch candlesticks. That's Revelation chapter 1, 11 through 13. We know that Christ makes intercession for us. We know that Christ imparts the living manna daily. And on October 22nd, 1844, the hour of his judgment is come. Praise the Lord. We see the entire plan of redemption right there. Jesus went into the holy place 31 AD. Pentecost took place, praise the Lord. And on October 22nd, 1844, the work of the holy place came to an end. Jesus moved into the most holy place. We're going to touch on that in our next study. October 22nd, 1844, until the close of probation is the most holy place work. Do you see that? And so phase one completed. Phase two completed. But phase three with you and I is still pending. Beloved, it is time to do what? Finish the work. Remember your name, Seventh Day Adventist. The seventh day signified a completed, a finished work. Do you remember that? A work of sanctification. It was a sign between God and his people that he is the Lord that sanctifies them, that makes them holy, amen, and that Christ would be able to come once that takes place. This is what we mean when we say it is time to finish the work. It means it is time to fulfill your mission, Seventh-day Adventist. The time is now. And as I said in the beginning, there is no name that can guarantee a mission success. Only choice can do that. Only your choice. Listen, God will not uh, force you into heaven. God will not force you into the way he wants you to eat, force you into the way he wants you to dress. God is not going to force you. He wants the service of love. Do you love Jesus? You know, if you don't love Jesus, beloved, do you understand that it is okay to admit that? In fact, God, God would prefer that we admit that we don't love him. You see, the reason why our love for Jesus is so low is because we refuse to admit our condition. When a man sees that his love for Jesus is too low, that man can confess it to Jesus. And do you know what Jesus says? I knew that. Do you know that Jesus is not surprised by what you think of him today? Jesus is not surprised that you don't like Bible study. He knows that. Jesus is not surprised that you love to eat the stuff that you eat. He knows that. Je Jesus is not taken by surprise. Beloved, the issue is that we will not come to him as we are. And some of us don't understand that when we come to him as we are, he never sends us away as we were. He will fix us, beloved. The man who does not love Bible study, that was me a long, long time ago. The man who has no interest in spiritual things, God is able to take that man and to make him shout from the rooftops the gospel of Jesus Christ. The young woman, beloved, who has no interest in dress reform, God is able to take her and make her an example of Christian character perfection, not only in the outward adornment, but inward. God will make you the very thing that you are not if you would just admit the fact that you are not and that you need his help to become what you ought to be. Seventh-day Adventist, your name is weighty. It, it has weight to it. But actions speak louder than words. The loud cry is not going to be a bunch of preaching. It's going to be demonstration. Actions speak louder than words. Actions become a loud cry. Do you see that? It is time to finish the work. We're told in the Great Controversy, page 489 in paragraph 1, that the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he did what? Began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to do what? Complete, to finish in heaven. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. Here's another thought here from Ransom and Reunion by uh, W.D. Frizee. He says, each one is different. A new individual. Did you ever see anyone like you before? Do you know that if you could find your duplicate, your value would drop at least 50%? But there is no danger. You are unique. 
God, keyword, beloved, needed. But beloved, catch this thing. God needed only one like you. But he needed that one. We were brought into existence, not merely because we were wanted. W.D. Frizee says, because we were needed. And that's him quoting the spirit of prophecy. Beloved, God brought us into existence because he needs us. Beloved, do you have anything that you can offer God that would make God richer? No. Do we have anything that we could offer God that would make God wiser? No. But if we offer God ourselves, do you understand that there's so much invested in us, invested in humanity, invested in this Adventist movement? Christ has invested all into you. And if we would but surrender ourselves, that's all he wants. He doesn't want you. He, he wants you, beloved. If we surrender ourselves, God is able to take all those seeds he planted in us and bring them all to fruition. Beloved, we have no idea. We have n never mind. There's the movement, but I'm talking to the people now. I'm talking to the individual. I'm talking to you. We have no idea what God desires to bring out of us. The Bible says that he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we are able to think or even ask. Beloved, surrender yourself. In the book of Genesis 3.15, we're closing right here. In the book of Genesis 3.15, the Bible gives us the first intimation of hope of that plan of redemption. And again, I say the plan is revealed in the sanctuary, but the way that is in the sanctuary is who? The man Christ Jesus. And thus the plan has always been that we receive the man Christ Jesus. Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Beloved, the majority of the Christian world believe that at the cross, Jesus crushed the head of Satan. That Genesis 3.15 reached its fulfillment at the cross with the death of Christ. Why do they believe that? The Bible says that Calvary is the place called Golgotha, was on a hill called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And so seeing that, they say that the serpent's head was completely crushed. On the screen here, you see the, the image of Genesis 3.15, Jesus crushing the head of the serpent. But I want you to understand something. At the end of the sanctuary service, not at the beginning, at the end of the sanctuary service, on the Day of Atonement, all right? From the most holy place, the priest comes out. He puts his hands on the head of the scapegoat, which symbolizes Satan. Question, why does the high priest at the end of the day of atonement, not on Passover, all right? Because Passover is when the lamb is slain. That's the cross. On the end of the day of atonement, the priest comes out of the most holy place and he puts his hand on the head of the scapegoat. Why the head? Why not the hooves? Why, why not the feet or the tail or the back? Why the head of the scapegoat? Because it was the head of the serpent that was promised to be crushed. The crushing of the head of Satan is at the end of the day of atonement. The very day in which we live right now, beloved. Now we're going to see that in our next study. But the, the plan of redemption was began on the cross. The crushing of the head began on the cross, but it is completed at the end of the day of atonement. One last text. 175 years after 1844, 175 years into this day of atonement, why Seventh Day Adventist? Romans chapter 16, our final text. Romans chapter 16, I want you to see this. Whether you're Adventist or not, Romans chapter 16, verses 19 through 20, the Bible says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning that which is evil. And the God of peace, Shiloh, are you listening? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under whose feet? Your feet. Shortly. Beloved, when were these words written? This is the book of Romans. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. When was Paul talking? Was this before the cross or after the cross that he wrote these words? This is after the cross, beloved. This is after Pentecost. Paul says, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. 
So then the bruising of Satan's head could not have been completed at the cross if the Apostle Paul penned these words after there, after the cross. Do you see the point? God is going to crush the head of Satan. God is going to fulfill Genesis 3.15 under the feet of his final movement, under the feet of his church. Why, beloved, uh, would God do that? I thought the promise was that Jesus would crush the head of the serpent. Beloved, the church is referred to in the Bible as the body of who? Christ. Christ is the head. We're simply the body. We're simply an extension of him. And so whether it is under his feet personally or the feet of this Advent movement bodily, beloved, it is still his body. It is still his feet. And so Christ crushes the head of the serpent at the end of the Day of Atonement because a people are finally prepared. The Bible says, a body hast thou prepared me who are living examples of the righteousness of Christ. Beloved, that is what our name means. Now, 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 the message is over here. The message is over here. I have no more to say. That is it. In fact, I have one more thing to say. There are those of us who, uh, there are those of us who uh, wonder to ourselves, Brother Paul, don't you know the skeletons that are in my closet? Don't you understand that I was this and I was that and that I'm in love with this and I still do these things? I watch what I ought not to watch. I eat what I ought not to eat. I dress however I want. I don't even go to church on Sabbath, Brother Paul. I'm only here by chance. Don't you understand that my skeletons are too much for Christ? Let me tell you something, beloved. The reason why Christ was crucified on a hill called Golgotha, the place of a skull, is because every skeleton in your closet has been crucified there. There is nothing in your experience that you could point out to me, nothing that you have done that you could point out to me that would relinquish my pursuit of giving you this man, Christ Jesus, because beloved, he knows. He knows who you are. He knows where you come from. He knows your weaknesses. Beloved, the Bible says he is touched with the feeling of your infirmities and that same Jesus accepts you today if you come to him just as you are, and the promise is you will never leave as you were. Beloved, this man is a good man. I want to be like Jesus. In fact, our name, Seventh-day Adventist, calls us to be like Jesus. Now, I'm going to close here with a word of prayer, beloved. In our next study, tomorrow, we're going to go into the 2300-day prophecy. I want you to understand that you have a prophetic birth date. You're not just another denomination. All right? You have a prophetic birth date. You're here for a reason. You came right on time, and God is going to finish the work with you right on time. Right on time. Father God, we thank you so much for the wonderful message that we have just partaken in. Father, we see that our name implies a heavy responsibility. And Lord, it is our desire to answer the call in this generation. It is our desire to be what you have called us to be. And so, Father, we ask that you take our hearts, for we cannot give it, and mold us after your image, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.